cyber risk insurance protect you against the threat of cyber attack? My speaker today is Conan Ward. He is president and general manager of Rubicon Risk. Conan, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. So I want to ask you about the current availability of cyber risk insurance for manufacturers. Is this a relatively new option or has it been with us for a while? Well, manufacturers over the last few years have represented a, a larger percentage of the overall uh, buying uh, commercial public uh, with respect to a dedicated cyber insurance offering. Uh, I think one of the developments that w is of particular concern to manufacturers is uh, traditional uh, property and casualty products, particularly property, had been utilized by manufacturers in the past to cover a degree of cyber risk. Uh, and it was often called silent cyber because the, the coverage wasn't actually declared. Uh, and those kinds of traditional markets really didn't have a ton of experience underwriting the cyber product. And a lot of them were, uh, have, have found themselves in litigation over some of the bigger losses like not pet and with Maersk and, and, uh, and Maersk, um, which were headline losses in the commercial market. Uh, but, uh, you know, there were disputes over, over coverage items and th those traditional policies really aren't built to, to suit the needs of buyers with respect to the post loss activity that goes on mm -hmm. after a cyber after a cyber event. Well, how, how long has it been since it was more specifically targeted at that threat, the industry in general, and that a product is designed specifically for that purpose? Yeah, the, the, the cyber dedicated product has existed for a while. Uh, it's, it's begun to mature over a number of years. Uh, it really started in the errors and omissions market uh, with respect to professional liability. But the, the policy itself is, is quite multifaceted and, and picks up uh, all manner of, of costs associated with, with a breach. Uh, and with respect to manufacturers in particular, I think you know, with the advent of internet facing uh, factory floor items and internet of things issues, um, you know, we're, we're seeing more and more threats uh, with sophisticated malware that can attack those kinds of machinery and, yeah. and really bring manufacturers problems. With the growing number of different types of threats, have you had to change the language in the product or can you, is it always just been kind of an umbrella that would cover just about any type of cyber event? Well, I think it's, uh, in terms of covering an actual cyber event, most of the policies that are dedicated cyber policies out there will pick up most of the different attack vectors. I think where buyers should be um, somewhat concerned, particularly manufacturers, is there is not a physical damage uh, coverage grant uh, with respect to every cyber policy. So, for instance, um, if some if a if a if a piece of malware were to get into the machinery on the factory floor and and fry that machinery not all policies even in in a dedicated cyber sense would respond the same way mm -hmm. and so you have a lot of the brokers uh working very diligently to try and figure out how to bridge that gap because the the property insurers have said we don't want to cover that kind of thing and the the cyber offering hasn't always kept up. Uh, and so what I would tell um, manufacturers is be pretty diligent in, in your discussions with your broker and make sure that you run through some loss scenarios and really make sure that you're getting the kind of coverage you want. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing to think about too is oftentimes there are different sublimits uh, associated with a, with a cyber insurance offering. And so manufacturers should, again, think through the kinds of scenarios that they might face vis-a-vis uh, -vis a, a cyber event and make sure that th they feel as though they've got enough coverage to, to, to get them through the, the crisis. Well, is the coverage predicated on a certain level of due diligence on the part of the employees of the manufacturer? For instance, if some kind of malware was introduced into the operation by a, the, due to the negligence of an employee, clearly not 
following the rules of the company to keep that kind of stuff out, would the policy still be upheld or would you decline to cover it? Most of them will will cover it. Uh, some of the language in some of the policies can be a little murky. Uh, and I don't think the industry is doing itself any favors in that regard, because I think, you know, if you look at um, 30 in the recent Verizon report um, on breaches, about 30 percent of overall breaches of, of the 4000 odd breaches they look at involved employees. Uh, it's a really, really likely avenue for a threat actor to get in. Uh, people get fished, people get socially engineered, they open the wrong email. Uh, and so most policies will, uh, will get rid of what's called a fidelity exclusion, which is acts of employees, either intentional or, 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 through, or through negligence, uh, mm -hmm. because there is a recognition in the marketplace that um, that's a very likely avenue. And, and even if, you know, oftentimes there's employee involvement. Sure. I mean, even the slightest oversight on the part of an employee can cause something like this. What about in the case of ransomware? Uh, does the policy cover the payment that a company would make uh, to? It, it, it would. Most, most of the policies will, will pick up the, the payment itself. Um, mm -hmm. There w typically there's uh, the client and the, and the insurer have to agree. Um, but it, it, generally speaking, how the, the policy responds is, you know, for a given manufacturer, it's, it's a terrible day and they've never, most likely they've never been through a breach before. And so from that standpoint, the crisis management piece of the policy can be very, very helpful. Uh, you bring in a breach coach, you bring in regulatory attorneys who can help you with, uh, it, all the if there's personal identifiable information involved, uh, that sort of thing, and and really keep the client on the the right legal track because there can be significant fines uh, at a state level or in the in Europe, for instance, uh, the the fines can be quite extreme uh, with respect to disclosure of data and and issues around personal data, and so yeah, yeah. The, and the technical advice that insurers bring along with them is is quite important too. For a manufacturer of a certain scale, I would guess that the cost of a cyber attack can be quite high, which exposes the insurer to quite a bit quite a bit of risk too, which leads me to think that policies are probably a little on the pricey side. Certainly, certainly the kind of thing that a manufacturer would want to examine, but at the same time probably costs a certain amount. How do you demonstrate or have you been able to demonstrate the advantages of having these policies, despite the fact that they probably do cost a certain, uh, you know, the certain amount to protect the insurer? Yeah, I think the way to think about it from it, perhaps a CFO's perspective is, um, you know, because the traditional property policies have now carved cyber out, the kinds of limits you have to buy with respect to cyber insurance, dedicated cyber insurance, should include all of those extra expenses, but really should be driven by the, the, the business income loss that you could potentially suffer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we think about manufacturing and, and, you know, almost everything is done on a just in time basis these days. And so if, if you get a, a critical piece of, of a critical industrial control or, or piece of manufa or manufacturing machine that's destroyed in a cyber attack, you know, that can that can keep you down for quite a long time because people typically don't have replacements laying around. They've they've got to get it, and um, and and so you've got to think about how long is our outage time, and um, you know what's the business income loss, and and back into the kinds of insurance limits that you might need. Yeah. Given the increasing prevalence of these attacks and the cost to business that they cause when they do happen, I would imagine that the cyber risk insurance industry is itself quite large and growing. Is there a reinsurance market? Is this a, is this a big market right now? And you know, can you give me a sense of it, just how big it is? Yeah, it's a little bit tough to figure out exactly what, what role the reinsurers do play, um, but they're, they're heavily involved. Uh, they sit behind most of the of the larger companies. And if you look at 2019, for instance, uh, the market's still young enough that it's, that it's quite concentrated. Uh, you know, 51% of the standalone cyber market sits with, uh, with about five players. 
um, which if you look at traditional property casualty products is, is quite concentrated. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we expect to happen is as uh, the, the traditional market gets rid of cyber risk, it's got to move over to a more dedicated cyber product, which we think is the right development for, for our clients. Uh, but we need to meet that capacity need, uh, both in, in terms of physical damage coverage uh, and those larger limits that are going to be uh, required for business interruption. Yeah. And I have to think that as the threat grows and as cyber thieves become more and more creative and we see more and more different techniques, which are potentially even more damaging to business, that your industry is going to really grow in the future going forward, correct? Uh, we think so. We think so. And that, uh, I mean, that's, and, and I think most people would agree on that and, and rate movement, uh, you know, insurance is a supply and demand business generally. Mm -hmm. And when cyber has been one of the, the slower markets to uh, move up from a price standpoint, but it's starting to happen, which tells us there's a little bit of capacity uh, dislocation. I think an important thing for manufacturers to think about too is uh, in terms of the, the threat base, um, while only about 10% of attacks are done by you know, government or state actors, uh, generally speaking, manufacturers represent a juicier target for those kinds of players because they like to get their hands on on IP, mm -hmm. on designs, on plans, and typically you can't find insurance coverage for that kind of thing. Uh, I think we as an industry need to do a little bit better of a job, and and maybe the solution is coming up, working with clients and coming up, up with an agreed amount for at which to value that IP, but. Um, right now, there isn't a, a great solution, but uh, you know, I think manufacturers are are being prudent, and they're mm -hmm. a lot of them are buying more often. Yeah, I've got to think that the industry will mature as the years go ahead. But even today, it sounds like it's a really important option for manufacturers to be looking at in terms of acquiring some type of cyber risk insurance. So, Conan Ward of Rubicon, uh, thanks very much for talking to us about it today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Bob. Take care.